This is our, I believe, our 19th uh, Gao Chen lectureship today, and it was uh, kicked off when uh, Sir Brian Hoskins, before he was Sir Brian Hoskins, so you better watch it. You might get knighted or something. Um, I started this off, and uh, it's a long list of very, very influential people that have been invited by the school over, over the years. And it's with a great pleasure today I introduce Dr. Clara Desser, uh, who's a senior scientist and head of the climate analysis section at NCAR within the Climate and Global Dynamics Division, CGD. Um, sometimes down at Foothills Lab, we called it the crying and griping division, but um, I won't say that. That's an inside NCAR joke. Um, so uh, Dr. Dresser got her uh, BS in Earth and Planetary Sciences at uh, MIT, went on to get her PhD in Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Washington under uh, Mike Wallace, and the title was uh, of her dissertation, Meteorological Characteristics of El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomena. Um, while at MIT, she was a research assistant at uh, Woods Hole, went on to University of Washington a research assistant while a uh, grad student, and then went to Ceres um, for uh, Oh, several years, uh, the University of Colorado, where she worked with Maurice Blackman and others at, at NCAR, and then finally uh, transferred over uh, 1997 to NCAR as a scientist too, and has moved up the scientist ladder, senior scientist, and now senior scientist section head. Um, Dr. Dresser has won the Editor's Award for the Journal of Climate, unlike Evgeny Fedorovich, who's won two Editor's Award, which was a slip of the AMS. But uh, she has also won the Meisinger Award um, with the AMS for uh, Outstanding Early Career Scientist and a fellow of both the AMS and the uh, American Geophysical Society. Um, on the CV, and I'm not sure if it's totally up to date, the CV had uh, 127 publications, and it's really, really very broad from sea ice to ENSO to uh, things happening in the ocean, in the atmosphere on uh, all sorts of different time scales. So it's uh, a very great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Desser. So we, we do uh, co commemorate uh, this day with a, uh, a plaque, a Gaochen, uh, Svi Gaochen Lectureship Distinguished Speaker. And uh, maybe we'll have a few people come up. Uh, Lou Wicker, who I was uh, one of Svee's students. Uh, we'll get uh, past director Fred Carr, maybe the uh, past dean John Snow, and our vice president for research up here for a picture. Wow, look at that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Wow, thank you very much. Oh, Jeff. Ex-provost, you come down here too, so. So if someone hopefully has an iPhone that you can take a picture or a, or a uh, <laughs> Samsung Thank if you you're really much. desperate. I'm really honored, really honored. Just want you to know. Get her in the middle here. Yeah, yeah get her in the middle. I was the one that hired her. Oh, where do you want me? Yeah, okay. There you go. See us all? It's kind of hard to hide. Okay. Hard to <laughs> say it's <sweet. laughs> Okay. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much. Very Thank you. No, Looking forward to your lecture. That was a smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were saying Svi, I think. Congratulations. Thank you so That's much. Awesome. Thank Great you. Job. It's wonderful. It's really wonderful. Well, thank you very much for coming, and it truly is a really great honor for me. Um, I did not know Dr. Tsvi Chen, but I did some homework, and uh, really, uh, I think, got to know the spirit of the person, as well as some of the work that he conducted um, over the years. And I very much thank uh, Dr. Parsons and the committee for uh, this honor. So today I'd like to talk to you about some uh, work um, we've been doing over the last few years uh, concerning climate projections uh, over North America and understanding what some of the uncertainties are that we face 
as a community uh, when we try to make such pro uh, projections. <clears throat> so these are some uh, uh, visuals of some of the uh, severe extreme weather events that the U.S. Uh, has experienced um, in the past few years. Hurricanes, drought, melting of Arctic sea ice, the famous Boston snowstorms, um, fire, um, et cetera. And of course, the public is very much uh, fixated on whether these events are attributable to human activity, um, to burning of fossil fuels. And of course, the answer is uh, much more subtle. It's not a black and white answer. Um, that there's a lot of natural internal variability in the climate system. And of course, this will always give us weather extremes. We expect wet records to be set every year, uh, just because uh, that's the nature of, uh, of, of uh, st uh, stochastic uh, records. But of course, there will be an influence from anthropogenic climate change and unraveling the relative importance of these effects, I think, is really of key importance um, for the climate, climate community. So I'd like to speak to some of the big picture uh, themes here, basically uh, understanding the relative importance of natural variability and human-induced climate change. So Dr. Gao Chen, uh, my, one of my introductions actually to him as a person uh, was written by his daughter Rivka Galchen, whose work I knew uh, be from my readings of the New Yorker and the New York Times, uh, this beautiful book called Atmospheric Disturbances, which is a portrayal of her father um, a few years after uh, he died. And I found it a beautiful, moving account and also learned a lot about uh, the type of science he did and his approach to science. And I found some connections uh, between the work I've been doing and his work, um, although we, looked at, we look at very, very different aspects of the climate system. But what we have in common is the butterfly, uh, which just is a symbol of the fact that it's, uh, we will never know uh, the initial state of the atmosphere or the ocean or any other component of the climate system with sufficient accuracy that we will not, that uh, there will always be errors, error growth in our predictions on any time scale. Uh, Dr. Gal Chen was, um, of course, um, focused on severe weather events and did a lot of work on understanding the predictability of severe storms. Um, but really, the same problem is true when we make climate projections, projections of climate over the coming decades, that these are also, um, of course, um, have uh, limited predictability and uh, impact um, our ability to narrow uncertainty when we make these projections. So I'd say we have the butterfly uh, in common here. So weather and climate prediction, I just wanted to highlight, of course, that these are very different uh, problems. So Dr. Gal Chen was focused on uh, the initial value problem. So knowledge of the initial conditions as best we know them, um, and then how that plays out in terms of error growth uh, in the system that you're predicting. I'm going to be talking about a very different class of uh, problem and that is the boundary value problem. So when we look at uh, climate change projections in the future, uh, these are the only reason why we can actually make any statements about uh, risk uh, in the future is that we know that the greenhouse gases are building up as we burn fossil fuels. So these greenhouse gas emissions um, are a boundary value to our climate system and they will be influencing the climate system in uh, the decades and centuries to come. And so that is an aspect that is very different from the initial value problem. And then, uh, so as you get out to the centennial time scale, the importance of the, of the boundary forcing, in this case, the amount of greenhouse gas 
uh, concentration in the atmosphere, that dominates. But I'm talking about this gray area in the middle, the decadal to multi-decadal uh, time scale, when there's this overlap between uh, the initial conditions and the ability to predict uh, climate and, and the boundary value, so the, the, uh, the knowledge of the change in the radiative forcing due to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So really the, the spot here that I'm, I'm addressing is really um, uh, an overlap between these two types of uh, uh, weather and climate prediction. So how do we make our climate projections? I'm sure as you all know, um, the community has organized for a couple of decades now, uh, since, 19, since the uh, 1980s, uh, to address this problem globally. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, every um, five years or so, uh, the community um, gathers and makes uh, sort of state of the knowledge assessment reports about climate change, change that has already occurred, change that is projected to occur in the future, and then of course what the leading um, uncertainties are in, in, these, in making such uh, projections. So this is the cover of the Working Group 1 report uh, that came out a couple of years ago. So as a community, we organize and we uh, use the state-of-the-art uh, global coupled climate models uh, around the world. And typically, they consist of atmospheric uh, model component, ocean, sea ice, uh, some aspect of land surface uh, uh, vegetation, and some aspect of biology. Um, some models are more complex than others in their representations, uh, but typically these are the uh, configurations of these global um, coupled climate models. So I'm focusing here on sources of uncertainty uh, for these projections, and there are three main uh, categories. One is uh, uncertainty due to, um, of course, deficiencies and, and differences amongst models. We don't have perfect representations of the climate system, so there will always be uncertainty associated uh, with that aspect. Then the second one is, of course, that uh, we don't have perfect knowledge of what the greenhouse gas emissions will be in the future. That all depends on societal response and all kinds of things. And that's the reason why they're called pro climate projections, not climate predictions, because we are projecting the radiative forcing changes and looking at the climate response. And then the third class of uncertainty has to do with the climate system has a lot of natural fluctuations, a lot of natural variability. And this will always be um, a, an upper bound, if you will, or a lower bound, sorry, for the uncertainty in our ability to make projections. So I'll talk about um, each one of these in turn a little bit. So starting with model uncertainty, so as I said, uh, we use different models to make these same uh, projections. Um, <clears throat> and for this last assessment report, there are something like 40 models. Uh, you might argue that they're not all independent, but there are something like 40 of these global coupled climate models. And they are all built uh, in somewhat different fashion, and they have different climate sensitivities, they have different parameterizations, different representations of the model, of the components of the climate system. Of course, they differ in their spatial resolution, in their vertical resolution, in their numerics, um, et cetera. So they're all going to give us somewhat different answers when we prescribe the same amount of uh, change in uh, radiative forcing due to greenhouse gas emissions. So this is model uncertainty. And I would say that the IPCC assessment reports has really been focused primarily on this source of uncertainty. And I think, in fact, we've missed the boat a little bit when we just focus on this aspect. So the second uh, source that I alluded to is our, of course, uh, you know, we can't foresee um, how our behavior 
uh, is going to change as we start warming the planet. And so we um, have run these climate models with different scenarios or prescriptions of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And these are the four that were used in the uh, last assessment report. And uh, by they're, they're labeled according to the change in radiative forcing in the year 2100 relative to some pre-industrial um, uh, value. So the red line there, the highest curve, that would signify that as a, the globe as a whole would undergo an extra 8.5 watts per meter squared in the year 2100 relative to, um, say, 1900. So that's an enormous change um, to, the, to the climate system. So to address the, um, the uh, the, this source, the magnitude of the climate response to these different emission scenarios, typically modeling centers will, will run simulations with their model for a subset or maybe all of these scenarios. And that gives us a handle on how broad of a spread you'll get just due to the uncertainty in the forcing. So the third uh, class of uncertainty is the one I'm going to focus on here today, and that's um, the notion of internal variability. So we're all familiar with this. Um, the atmosphere, of course, is a very chaotic, dynamical uh, system, and it features intrinsic large-scale patterns of variability in the circulation. This has to do with mean flow, eddy mean flow feedbacks, baroclinic systems, um, uh, low frequency variability in the atmosphere. And this is a, just a dynamical property of, of, the, f our, um, of the fluid of the, atmospheric, um, of the atmosphere itself. So these large scale teleconnection patterns, if you will, are always going to be present and they fluctuate on all time scales and uh, we really can't ignore them on any time scale, is what I'll uh, argue today. Of course, the ocean, we think of a much longer, slower system. Um, it has a lot of thermal inertia. The thermohaline circulation is um, sort of a, uh, one key component of, of the uh, intrinsic variability of the ocean. And that, uh, that can oscillate or fluctuate <coughs> Um, on its own without any uh, forcing, uh, any variability in the atmosphere, any coordinated variability. And then finally, the coupled system gives us a new class of phenomena, and these are more on the interannual to de decadal time scale. We're all familiar with the El Nino <laughs> Southern Oscillation, the primary mode of interannual variability. And then there are uh, other classes of uh, patterns called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, in quote, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. And these are patterns, I would say the mechanisms are not fully understood, but the patterns are, um, have been documented from, from the observations. And our models uh, can replicate these patterns to some degree, but uh, there are certainly still deficiencies. And I put the term oscillations in quotes, and I want to caution everyone that, you know, we have 150 years, let's say, of, of, of observations with which to define these patterns. And just because we see maybe one or two cycles of these patterns, it doesn't mean that they are truly oscillatory. Really, I think it's better to think of them as a continuum, as sort of red noise uh, processes. So this is internal variability. And again, each one of these components has very limited predictability. Even if the time scales are long, um, we cannot actually, I mean, it's been demonstrated, the predictability even of the ocean's thermohaline circulation, or ENSO for that matter, is very limited. And um, so what I'm talking about today is really beyond any, pos any predictability that is realized from these modes. So I'm really talking about that these modes are a source of an unpredictable source of uncertainty in our ability to make climate projections. We cannot predict these modes um, in any f uh, shape or form um, out, you know, 10 years in the future. 
And I'm talking about time scales, time horizons beyond that. So the important thing here is what I've written in the bottom here, which is that our climate models, when we run our simulations with this prescribed um, greenhouse gas emissions scenarios, that we need to do this more than once with each model. We need a large number of realizations because the way that the internal variability plays out can be very different between different realizations. This is because uh, there is no predictability to the internal variability. So the only way to account for, capture um, this superposition of the internal variability and the greenhouse gas force response, the only way to really, um, to, uh, to get, uh, to really evaluate this is through having many, many simulations with a single model. So just schematically what I'm talking about here is that especially on the local and regional scale where of course we all live and where we are impacted by climate change, uh, we really have to um, always have this picture in mind that the natural variability and the human influence coexist. And even on time scales, say, of 50 years, you might think that's long enough that the natural variability is going to be really not an important component. But I'm going to show you today that that's really not the case. And it's only when you go out, you know, a whole century um, that the human influence might, might start to dominate. And this picture is meant to be schematic. Of course, it depends on you know, whether you're interested in snowpack or summer precipitation or temperature or Arctic sea ice, they all have different ratios of relative magnitudes of the natural and the human uh, influence. Okay, so that was sort of my general background. I realize I'm talking to an audience that um, where I've learned so much from my discussions this morning. Um, that maybe the background of the large-scale climate system is um, not quite as familiar. So the outline for the rest of the talk here, uh, first I'm going to uh, give you just the highlights of this work on North American climate proje uh, projections. And I'm just keeping it at a very general level. And if, if this is of interest to you, there's much more you can read about in some recent papers, but I'm keeping it general just to, because there's a lot of uh, implications then that follow uh, from the work that I'll present. And so the second part of the talk will really be focused on the implications. And the first will be um, how we interpret the intermodal spread within the so-called CMIP uh, archives, the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project archives that many, many climate researchers are now using. The second implication I'd like to um, discuss is how we interpret recent climate change that we've observed and how to go about untangling the human-induced component from the natural component. And then this really all now ends in the challenge of model evaluation, how uh, difficult a, a, uh, it is for us, actually, to evaluate our models. And it really uh, just is highlighting uh, that aspect. I don't have answers. I'm just uh, pointing things out. So this uh, implications, um, this or the interpretation of recent climate change, I'll be showing results from some newer work and also some, from some work that I'm currently doing that's not published yet. OK. so. Um, as I said, I'm going to focus in the first part of the talk with the uh, projections uh, for the next um, several decades. And what we've done is we've taken the, um, the NCAR climate model. We could have taken any other model, but a state-of-the-art uh, coupled uh, global climate model. In this case, the community Earth system model uh, at one degree uh, spatial resolution, so say 100 kilometers, uh, something like that. And as is typically done, we start our model, first we spin it up from rest, and then we run a long control run under pre-industrial conditions, calling it 1850 greenhouse gas uh, um, 
conditions. And we, and we run that long enough to get some kind of quasi-equilibrium between the deep ocean and the rest of the climate system. So you can think of that as being um, in, in quasi-steady state. And then we evaluated that run as it went along, and then when we deemed it to be in, in quasi-equilibrium uh, in the year 400 or 401, I guess, that's when we started our simulation of the historical record. So from 1850 to, to all the way uh, to 1920, or to the present actually, we then did the typical um, protocol, which is to, um, to impose the observed trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions, ozone depletion, volcanic eruptions, you know, um, you name it, the typical radiative forcings that, are, that, that, we, that we use. And then we took the RCP 8.5, the high-end scenario, and that's how we carried that simulation through to the future. So that's the blue line. That's the single run that we've conducted with this climate model that most modeling centers do, like a single run. And then what we did differently here was in the year 1920, we introduced a round-off error. So this is Svigal Chen's butterfly we introduced a round-off error to the atmospheric temperatures. And this is of the order of 10 to the minus 14 uh, degrees Kelvin. So truly the round-off error parameter in this, in this, um, in this model. And then we ran, we've, we're now up to 42 simulations. Uh, initially our target was 30, but we um, had some extra resources. So we've run all of these. Um, uh, we've run another 40 simulations here. Same model, same radiative forcing. The only difference is this round-off error in the atmospheric model component. So truly unpredictable source of spread amongst these projections. Each of these simulations begins from the identical ocean, ice, and land states. And that's taken from the year 1920 from this first run of the model. So it's important that, you know, this is, this is the setup for everything that I'm going to show you. Um, it's, it's truly unpredictable uh, source of spread of these simulations. Um, so that was with CESM1. Uh, back um, maybe five years ago or so, we actually had done the first of these so-called large initial condition ensembles, and this was with the CCSM3, an earlier uh, version of the model. And I'll show you a few results from that, that's why I'm showing it to you here. And that, that set of runs only went from the year 2000 to the year 2060. What I find is actually these two sets of model uh, large ensembles are, are, are pretty similar, actually. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll show you results from both. So my focus uh, for the talk today is on North America. I've also uh, presented global maps in some of the papers, if you're interested. And I'm also going to focus here on wintertime and looking at the surface air temperature, the SAT. But again, there are results for the summertime and for precipitation in some of the papers. So what you see here is the top map is the, uh, if, if you just fit a linear trend to the temperatures at each grid box in the model <coughs> for the next 50 years and plot the slope of those trends, that's what you're seeing here. So think of it as the linear change in temperature uh, for the uh, 50 years into the future. And it's got a pretty simple pattern. Um, it's strongest as you go up towards the Arctic and we understand the, the physics of this so-called polar amplification uh, driven in large part by the melting of sea ice and the uh, melting of the snow, snow cover, and that's leading to this poleward amplified uh, warming signal. But that's only when you average all 40 runs together. And when you do that average, what you're doing is you're actually um, <clears throat> minimizing the internal variability because the internal variability is, is um, phased differently from one simulation to another. 
So we have a lot of confidence that this is the actual forced response to the greenhouse gas increase. But if you only had one run, so I'm showing you two runs here. One is the warmest, uh, the warmest over the U.S. as a whole, the one that, that warms the most over the next 50 years. And then I'm showing you on the bottom the one that has the least amount of warming over the U.S. in the next 50 years. So, of course, nature is only going to give us one run. It's not going to give us the average of 40. So really, the way to compare, to think about climate change in the future or to compare our models with nature for the past, we really have to look at individual runs. So this middle one, the one that warms the most, a lot of warming um, coming down into the eastern part of North America looks substantially different from the greenhouse gas forced response. And that's because this single run, you have this superposition of the greenhouse gas forcing and whatever sequence of internal variability happened to occur in this particular run. And then in the lower panel, um, the run that, that warmed the least, in fact, it even cooled slightly <laughs> uh, in parts of uh, Montana and the Dakotas, despite the fact that the greenhouse gas emissions are ramping up just as much as any other of the runs. So this really opened our eyes, and I was actually shocked when we first got this result. There must be something wrong. It can't be the same model and the same amount of greenhouse gas forcing. How could they look so different? But they do. So that really made us really think about the importance of the internal variability. So just um, to just illustrate this more in a, um, in a time series view, we picked out a few locations here um, going from uh, Mexico, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Seattle, Washington, uh, the U.S. as a whole down here, and then the global, globe as a whole. So what we've done is the uh, black curves are the observed wintertime air temperature records uh, from these stations. And then uh, the red and the blue curves are just the model extensions for these locations. And uh, we match uh, the model and the, and the, and the real data <coughs> over the period of five-year overlap just to visually show show the difference in the trends. So for example, Seattle is particularly um, you know, uh, evident here that um, you could get um, one of these simulations could warm by something like four degrees, or maybe the real world or one of the simulations actually cools slightly. And if, and if you look here on the right, this is the histogram of the temperature trends for the next 50 years for each of these locations. And so you can see, for example, Seattle, Washington, here's the member that cooled slightly, and you can get a member that warms by five degrees or something. So this is kind of giving you the distribution of warming trends, again, over five decades that according to this model, is consistent with the, with the forced response and the internal variability. So there is a wide range of outcomes, according to this model, that we should expect. Um, and we find very similar results with the newer model. Now, the globe as a whole, that's really not the case. The globe is, you know, really pinned by just radiative uh, um, uh, processes, and so, of course, when you look at the globally average temperature, this is just the land, land temperature, so there's a little bit of spread, but if you looked at the true global average, there would be just about nothing. So again, it depends on the spatial scale that you're looking at, uh, how, how big this spread is. It depends on the location, the latitude, the season, the parameter of interest. So I'm going to highlight what I think is really important for the spread, and that is the role of the large-scale atmospheric circulation. So I'm just going to give you like a case study first, and then I'll make it uh, more general. Okay, so case study. So this is showing you just the maps that you saw before. Um, and um, again, the winter surface air temperature trend over the next 50 years. 
that's the color. And then the uh, contours are the trend in the sea level pressure field. And I'm calling it run A and run B. I don't even remember anymore what the, the actual runs were. So run A uh, features uh, a, a trend toward higher pressure over the uh, North Pacific, the ridge. And not surprisingly, of course, then the anomalous flow will be bringing cold air down over uh, parts of the western par portion of the continent. And that's going to, of course, influence um, the temperatures there. Run B actually had um, a, a deeper Aleutian low, and the contour interval here is uh, one hectopascals. So something like six, six, seven hectopascal trend of either sign. I mean, that's the eye opener here. And so Run B, you're going to get a lot of warm advection into the western part of the continent, and no wonder it's a lot warmer here in Run B than it is in Run A. And just you know, very qualitatively speaking, this is sort of uh, consistent with our expectation of how the large-scale circulation trend will imprint on the surface air temperature trend. So in the model world, we can, we can do the simple arithmetic that we really can't do in the real world. And we can take this apart. <clears throat> so we can partition the actual total trends in any single run of this model into the part that was forced by the greenhouse gas changes. And we obtain that forced, forced component by averaging all 40 runs, just what I showed you before, that top map. So that's the force component. You see all the warming to the north. And now I'm showing you the force component of the sea level pressure trend. It's only something like two hectopascals maximum at, any, uh, at this location. And it's a, a slight ridge over the western part of the country. Then you subtract the force component from the total, and that's how we get what was due to just the, the random sequence of internal variability that happened to occur in that run. And the important thing here is that the colors and the contours are all on the same scale for all of these panels. So now you can really see how this high pressure and the low pressure to the east really cooled uh, most of Canada here, consistent with the, you know, the, just the, the direction of the anomalous wind. And uh, whereas the internal component in this run really warmed much of uh, the northern part of the continent. So it's very important to compare then the relative amplitudes of the forced and the internal component. And in this case, they're very comparable in the wintertime. And that's, of course, what's giving us the spread. So now I'm going to try to make this a little more general. Um, so here are the sea level pressure trends from just 10, uh, 9, I guess, of the 40 runs, just picked randomly. And this is numbers 10 through 18. I could, I could show you any of them, show you all 40. And the point I'm trying to highlight here is, again, that you can get you know, high pressure trends or low pressure. It's all over the place, the patterns. The amplitudes, the sign is all over the place. So imagine you have 40 of these. And you want to know, OK, what's, you know, what's, what's going on here in a more general sense? So we uh, did EOF analysis, empirical orthogonal function analysis, of these 40 maps. I'm only showing you nine, but we did them of all 40. So it's not EOF analysis in the time domain. It's really of these maps. We're treating them as different different uh, uh, members. And then we can get the dominant mode of, of variability of the circulation trends in the next five decades. So the dominant mode is shown here. And uh, the sign is arbitrary, but we're showing it with a sign that is uh, low pressure in the North Pacific. This is the surface manifestation of the Pacific North American pattern, the PNA pattern. This is the model's surface uh, rendition of the PNA. If you look at the 500 millibar height uh, pattern that goes with this, it's a very nice match to the, um, to the observed PNA pattern. This mode explains almost 60% of the variance of those 40 trend maps. So it truly is a dominant mode. That's why we're interested in it. And then the colors are showing you what the associated temperatures are 
associated to this, to this pattern. So it gives you warmer temperatures in the northwestern part of the continent and cooler temperatures in the southeast. So this dominant mode, then you have to weigh that, that's the internal variability, weigh it against the forced response, which you've seen before. That's the average of all 40 members. So what are the, the 5 and 95 percent confidence intervals that we should expect for future trends in the next five decades just due to this one circulation pattern? So you can just take the two sigma value of this PNA pattern or the minus two sigma that brackets your 95% your confidence interval and you add or subtract it from the forced response. So this is, I'm just trying to be a little more general here. So if the only circulation pattern that existed was the PNA, its internal variability gives us this map and that affects the temperatures. If we then uh, subtract this map from the forced response, we're down here at the 5% end of the distribution. That's this map, and if we, add, if we add it, we're down here. So think of these two as the bookends, okay, of what to expect because of the superposition of the PNA internal pattern and the forced response. And you can see, first of all, obviously the sea level pressures are, you know, almost entirely due to just the internal variability. But the temperatures, how much warming you get over at any location over North America is widely different. And just to show you that it's not an artifact of EOF analysis, we'll come back to run A and B. And there's a very good match between run A and this more general analysis based on all 40 members. So the take home here is just to expect this range um, due to the large scale circulation. So I'm going to move a little bit quickly because I want to make some points now about implications. Um, so the first is an obvious one. Uh, given what I've shown you of the internal variability in one model, we better be very cautious when we compare models if we don't have enough samples to really separate what's due to the forced response and what's due to the internal variability. And of course, if, it's, if the spread amongst models is mainly due to the internal variability that is unpredictable, then we really can't reduce our uncertainty beyond that level of the internal variability. So I'm just going to show you this in a qualitative sense. These are the sea level pressure trends 50 years into the future from nine of the models in the CMIP-3 archive. Looks very similar in CMIP-5. I picked these alphabetically. There's no cherry picking. And just to show you that some models feature a deepening of the uh, North Pacific pressures and some feature uh, a, a ridge. This is the GFDL model. This is the Australian model. Maybe GFDL thinks they're better than the Australian model. I would say we really cannot conclude that because we don't know if this has to do with the different differences amongst the models or just the different sequence of internal variability that happened to occur in each one of these runs. And here's the, the nine members I showed you from the CCSM3-1 model. We know this is internal variability and the color scale is the same. So qualitatively, uh, it's on a par. And I'll just show you one more quantitative result. So this is the future trends next five decades for uh, North America as a whole. So I'm just averaging all the temperature, wintertime temperatures, temperature trends over North America. And uh, these are the histograms. And there are two sets of histograms. And they're all with this uh, RCP 8.5 forcing. The gray histograms come from, we only had 30 realizations at the time from the CESM1. So that gives us a range between something like 2.9 degrees to 5.1 degrees. That is the range of uh, uncertainty or a range of temperature trends that we get from the one model. And then the red bars give you the range across 38 cement models different models and just pick one run from each one. 
And you can see that you know, the internal variability, at least in this one model, accounts for maybe two-thirds of the spread within the CMIP archive. So I'm just trying to say that model spread maybe is not is a red herring. It's not due to the differences between models. It's just due to that we sample different sequences of, of internal variability. I want to move on to, um, may I go to 430 or what is the uh, time here? Uh, it's okay to do another 10 minutes here? Okay, great. So, um, so the uh, second implication, so the first was how to interpret or be cautious <coughs> when you're interpreting the CMIP model archive spread. So the second implication is, uh, made me think about, well, wow, if there's this much spread in the future trends, let's go back and look at the past 50 years and uh, think about how to interpret those trends in light of what I've just shown you for the future. So this is some recent work, um, just came out in Journal of Climate. So I'm just keeping 50 years as my nominal period, and I'm looking back at the last 50 years, again, wintertime uh, air temperature trends over North America. So this uh, panel shows you uh, the observed temperature trends. I, I've We've compared many, many data sets. I think this is the HAD crew, the Hadley Center data. But they're all, you know, for, for my purpose, uh, very, very similar. So we've had a lot of warming over uh, Western Canada here, and actually not that much warming in the, um, in the West. So that's been the observed tr uh, change, linear change in temperature in the wintertime over North America in the last 50 years. It is warming everywhere. It has somewhat polar amplified pattern. You might naively just interpret this as being entirely due to the buildup of greenhouse gases over the last 50 years. And I'll show you that that's, um, we cannot make that, make that statement. So we take, again, our large ensemble, our large initial condition ensemble. This is with the CESM1, the most recent version. When we wrote the paper, we only, only had 30 members, but that was plenty. Um, and I'm showing you all 30 members here. So these are trends for the last 50 years. One model, same change in greenhouse gases over the period. And look how different uh, each of them looks from one another. So some of them get a lot of cooling over Canada, cooling, even though greenhouse gases are ramping up. Some of them get a lot of warming. Run number seven happens to look a lot like observations. If we were lucky and run number seven had been our first run with this model, we might have concluded we have the best model ever. And if this had been run number one, you know, we may have decided never to run this model again. And both, of course, would be, you know, facetious statements. Um, and you have to think about just how to interpret this. So let me help you along with how to think about it. So here I'm bringing in the circulation again, because I do think that's a key. So the it's a little hard to see the contours, but there was a lowering of the sea level pressure here and um, sort of anomalous southerly flow in the OBS. And that looks like run number seven, where you had a, a very strong deepening of the Aleutian low. And run number 28, where you had cooling here, you actually had a buildup of high pressure. So the important thing here is in this panel. This is the ensemble mean, OK? So that, oh, I guess you can't see my cursor. Oh, you can, OK. So this is the average of all 30 members' trends. So we interpret this as being the forced response to the greenhouse gas rise. And uh, this is the warming uh, that, we, that this model says is due to the greenhouse gas emissions. And there's almost no contours on here. And it's the same contour interval for everything. So according to this model, 
really there was no forced circulation response. So that means that all of the contours that you see on all of these panels is internal variability. And that's what makes each of these so different in their temperatures. And if we, you know, go one step further and say, you know, we really believe the model that there was no forced sea level pressure change, and then come down to look at the observations, then we can say, look, all the warming that was due to that particular circulation pattern is actually the internal component, or one aspect of the internal component. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to account for how that circulation pattern, or that trend in the circulation, how that might have, uh, caught what kinds of temperature trends that might have caused, and then we want to remove it to get the actual, or our estimate, of the human-induced greenhouse gas forced component. So I can't at all go into uh, the, uh, the technique that we used, but I just say that it's based on constructed circulation analogs. We detrend the data, and this is a way of, um, so we get circulation analogs, we get lots and lots of them, and we do a lot of resampling. Mm -hmm and uh, from the historical time period. And then we find, okay, with these circulation analogs, we have the associated temperature anomalies at each location. And that's what we then uh, subtract, okay, from the observed map. So that's what I'm gonna show you in a nutshell. I've just glossed over the whole appendix of this paper uh, in a few words, but it's just too, too, too detailed to go into. So our estimate is this was the actual warming trend that I showed you at the beginning in the OBS. And this is what we say is due to the internal dynamics, the internal uh, part of the circulation trend in the OBS. And you can see that it contributed to a lot of warming just where you have the maximum warming in the total. If you average over this region of uh, most of Canada, <clears throat> our estimate is, so Canada warmed by something like three and a half degrees C, and our estimate is about half of that was actually induced by the circulation, which in turn was just internal variability. So if you had said all of this was due to human influence of greenhouse gas emissions, you would have been off by a factor of two in terms of how much uh, warming would have, we would have expected. If we subtract this component due to the internal circulation, this is the pattern that we get as the residual. And we're interpreting this loosely, loosely as the radiative response to the greenhouse gas forcing in the absence of any internal circulation change. And I would say that it looks somewhat like the, the forced response in this model, which we get by averaging all the ensemble members. So we try to just, you know, put, try to understand the observations uh, through this technique. I'm going to skip this slide. I think it'll uh, take a little too much time, but uh, you're welcome to see it in the paper. Okay, so the, the, the very last few points I want to make just are qualitative, um, but this is a new line of work that uh, my colleague Dave Thompson at CSU really spearheaded, and now we are um, carrying this forward. So all of what I've shown you really uh, rests on how credible the model simulation is of internal atmospheric circulation variability. And then, of course, its climate sensitivity and response to the greenhouse gas forcing. So we want to be able to, um, you know, evaluate the internal variability in the model, but also use the observations internal variability to constrain our climate projection uncertainty. Um, so what we've done here, um, and just bear with me, if this interests you, you can look at the paper. But what Dave Thompson and Libby Barnes and, and ourselves did was to recognize that actually there's a very simple, whoops, a very simple dependence, whoops, uh, 
Maybe they don't want me to say that. Uh, sorry, how do I get back? Uh, sorry, I'm not quite sure how to get back to the PowerPoint. Is that right? PowerPoint? Oh, no, it was PDF. That's right, it was acro. So tell me when I should stop because I can, I'm still good to go? Okay. So, uh, very nice analytical formula here that relates the amplitude of the internal interannual variability. We have a lot of knowledge about that because we have roughly 100 years of data in the observations. We know a lot about how the circulation varies from one year to the next. So the standard deviation of the uh, interannual variability is sigma here. And if you want to get the confidence interval for a trend of any length, n sub t, it's this formula. It kind of boils down to that. It's modified a little bit if you have some autocorrelation in your data, but not a lot. So this number 48 is sort of, I forget where it comes from, but there it is. So really, it happens that the 5 and 95 percent uh, confidence interval on a trend of 50 years, which is what I happen to be showing, I mean, this, this came much later in the work, uh, is on the, uh, roughly speaking, twice the interannual standard deviation. So if we have knowledge of the interannual standard deviation from observations, we can then use a model's forced response plus the observed interannual variability to get our confidence level on the uncertainty <coughs> in, in future climate trends. So it's a really nice way to bring, to constrain the model and to bring in the observed statistics of the variability to talk about what is our uncertainty in our future climate projections. So I'm going to come back to our example of the PNA. So on the left, this is what I showed you uh, earlier in the talk. This is now, so proof of concept, this is now based on the CSM1 40-member ensemble. What I showed you earlier was based on the earlier model version. So this number 56, it used to be 59%, but it's really still a very dominant mode. So this was that EOF of trends. Now I'm showing it to you for the 50 years starting now. And it is the PNA pattern, and this pattern relates to temperatures in this fashion. On the right-hand side, you have the leading EOF of the, just the interannual variability from the model from the historical time period. So it has nothing to do with the future. It's still a dominant mode of variability. And, um, uh, and you can see that the scaling works really well. I've already multiplied uh, one of these by two. Um, yeah, this one by two. So actually, that formula works pretty darn well. Not exactly, and you know, that has to do with some autocorrelation in the data, and the patterns are slightly different. So this is proof of concept in the model world that we can maybe use the interannual statistics to go to the uncertainty in trends of 50 years length. So now, all right. Let's validate our model. So here's the observed interannual variability. Here I'm using, I think I'm using 20th century reanalysis for sea level pressure, but I get similar results with other, you know, real data sets. And then uh, the temperatures that go along with that. So for observations for this time period, 1920 to 2014, very long record, detrended the data. This pattern accounts for almost, you know, 50%. And it looks really sim uh, the model looks really similar to the OBS. So we should have really nice, you know, it's a really gold star for the model. So now, let me simply take this as my, as a surrogate for the uncertainty of the trends. And so I'm going to do the same trick where I'm going to add and subtract two sigma of this pattern. And this is what you get. So these are the bookends, if you will. The expected range of projected trends uh, for the winter time for the next 50 years based on the observed variability of the PNA pattern. And then the forced response we have to get from somewhere. 
Here we got it from the ensemble mean of all 40 members. You could have gotten it from the CMIP multi-model mean. You can do many things. Of course, you want to add that uncertainty in as well. But here I'm just showing it to you, uh, the model force response from CESM1. So these are, this, so if somebody tells me, well, I'm expecting the elution low to deepen in the next 50 years, I'm going to say no way because that interannual variability is so large that it gives you a residual on a 50-year time scale. And the forced response is so small <laughs> that really you're going to be dominated by that internal variability. And then if you look at, you know, regions here, they're, they're not warming as much in this particular realization or depiction as they are here. And in case you're wondering how the model did, this was the actual range using the model sea level pressure trend, EOF. And it's not bad. So I would advocate that this is maybe a way forward, a really useful way forward of combining or evaluating the model and then combining the observed information with the model's forced response. I think they're, they're most credible for that because that's the radiatively forced response. And then using that information in combination. And then I'm going to make a plug here, just two more slides, um, for, <clears throat> which, uh, for two um, efforts that we have uh, doing in uh, the section that I lead, the climate analysis section, uh, on uh, topics, so evaluating internal variability in climate models. So I hope I've convinced you that that's of paramount importance for this whole study of climate projections and interpretation of past climate change. So I encourage you, if you're interested, just go to, go to my website. You'll get a link for this climate variability diagnostics package. And basically, it just does a lot of stuff under the hood. And all you have to supply is your own, if, you're int if you have a model run, and if you have particular observations that you want to compare to, it, it computes things for you. It does all the EOFs and um, with whatever number of runs you want to use, any time period, you get beautiful maps, the kinds of maps I've just been showing you, that's what you get. And importantly, under e underneath each map, you're going to get the actual net CDF data file of the pattern, of the PC time series, all the metrics that we compute. It doesn't take long at all to run this. If you ran it on all the CMIP models, I think it took a half hour. So it's a really nice thing. And we've already done a lot of work for you. We've run it on all the CMIP 3 and 5 models. So um, I'm going to skip this, but this is the PNA pattern for a subset of models and a subset of observations. And you can immediately you know, make some comparisons. So please look at it, and we're, we're always uh, you know, developing it. So if there's anything you'd like us to add or things to improve, just give me an email. We'd love to do it. And then the second project we have in my, in my section, uh, we're sort of the observational section of the Climate and Global Dynamics Division. So, you know, not all observational data sets are created equal. They all have their strengths. They all have their limitations. Uh, what's the best one to use? Let's say I wanted to use a data set on snow cover. I have no experience. Who can tell me about the ins and outs of the snow cover data sets? So this project is a community project we, where we've elicited expert user guidance on, on nearly 80 or 80 data sets at this point for a wide range of variables. Um, and um, uh, a lot of people are viewing this page, and we may even ask many of you data experts you know, to write commentaries on the data sets that you know a lot about. This is a worldwide resource for the climate community, and it only gets better as more and more people contribute to it. So I hope, I hope that you look at that as well. Uh, I'm not sure what to say. If I say OK, that's sure. OK. <laughs> I don't want more info at this point. <laughs> OK, summary and outlook. So the takeaway points that I'd like you to have, um, the first is, again, this we should expect a range of climate changes 
um, over the next many decades when we're looking at climate change on local and regional scales. And this is just due to the superposition of the greenhouse gas force response and the internal variability. And then I try to argue that I think there's good evidence to show, uh, that the spread in our projections made with a single model is mainly, at least for the, the region that I looked at, mainly due to the large-scale atmospheric circulation. And these are unpredictable. This is all from that round-off error, that butterfly effect at the beginning of the simulation. Uh, again, really be cognizant of the possible role of the internal atmospheric circulation variability when you're interpreting observed climate change, climate trends. And I really, uh, I think the community is really recognizing the value of these large initial condition ensembles. There are now many modeling groups around the world um, that are running these and they're useful First of all, to define the forced response, you need many realizations before you can really isolate what was forced and what was internal. And that's the only way where we can really compare models, apples to apples, and then of course comparing our models with nature, it, it really informs that comparison. And this, uh, these model runs, any of the runs that we do in my group at NCAR, um, they're all available for anyone to look at. It's a real uh, gold mine, I would say, um, for uh, anybody's theses and uh, research activities. So you're welcome to, to, to get the results. Thanks a lot. <laughs>